Hey everyone, welcome to Tent Talk, the farmer's market podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets, how to increase your market business success, and in our current climate, maximize safety while providing people with fresh food. Farmer's markets are essential. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer or food maker selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. This week, we're chatting with Sari Kimball of Food Business Success about finding success as a packaged food producer. Hey everyone, I'm one of your hosts, Bridget Myers. I've spent years as an on-site farmer's market manager and I'm the education coordinator at Farmer's Market Pros. And I'm Kat Fields-White, director of San Diego Markets, still an active farmer's market manager, founder of Farmer's Market Pros and host of the Farmer's Market Pros community and Intense, the Farmer's Market Conference. And I'm Justine marzoni Mead, Tent Talk producer, marketing director for Farmer's Market Pros and logistics coordinator for Intense, the Farmer's Market Conference, 2021, which is coming up very quickly, will be live online March 15th through 18th. Well, welcome back to Tent Talk, everyone. Today we are chatting with Sari Kimball of Food Business Success about helping packaged food vendors grow and succeed at farmers markets and beyond. Sari is a consultant and educator for CPG creators and currently a market manager. Grocery vendor education is an important part of Intense, the Farmer's Market Conference 2021, and our Vendor 101 program, so we love sharing additional resources. Welcome, Sari. Thank you all. Thanks so much for having me. It's super fun to be here. Yeah, we're so glad to finally connect with you, like you said offline before we started. We've kind of been like circling each other for a while. Definitely our audiences are similar, so we're so excited to meld minds and share your background with our listeners. That's right. Yeah. Got some mutual friends. Yeah. I think, I think Sari knows Allie Ball. Yeah. yeah. We love Allie Ball. Allie Ball. We love yeah. our girl Allie. She's so great. Ashley Colepart, too. Oh, oh Ashley, yeah. yeah. Oh, we love Ashley. She's like an OG, um, <laughs> yeah. intense uh, speaker. conference speaker. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah she's awesome. the best. So cool. Well, hi, um, Ashley. <laughs> hi. Can we get started just by um, you filling us in a little bit about your background um, and, in particular, your farmer's market experience as a vendor and a manager? Yes, uh, we have to go way back for for the farmer's market piece, but uh, I have had my um, food business success uh, for, I I launched that program in 2019, Um, but going back farther, uh, I really started in food and agriculture. Uh, I worked on a farm and uh, organic farm, and I was selling into restaurants, into small retail And then we also attended farmer's markets in Fort Collins, Colorado is where I'm based. Um, And so I was slinging eggs and meat and produce and um, getting up early and and doing those uh, days at the farmer's markets. And, uh, And then I transitioned over to Whole Foods Market and I was a buyer and then I was the marketing director for the local store. And I really carried my love of local food uh, into that world and really tried to bolster up uh, local producers as much as I could, wherever I could. And at the time, this was pre-Amazon, but uh, Whole Foods had, you know, and they still do, but had really tight, um, really great local, local programs, right? They really valued local and so was always trying to to bolster up that program, do a lot of community events. I mean, I did a lot of um, events where we had vendors there. And so not quite a farmer's market, but uh, <laughs> lots of outdoor events. And, and then um, I left Whole Foods in 2015. And that's when I started my own thing. And I actually managed a commissary kitchen for a little while. And that's where I really kind of brought all of these pieces together and said, you know, there's really something here. When I was meeting with those packaged food producers who were so excited and they they wanted to start at farmer's markets or they wanted to go into small wholesale and they were so excited and they would bring me their, you know, their application for the kitchen and I would tell them all the things and then they'd be like, okay, great. We're, you know, just sign this piece of paper. And then I would say, well, what's your business model and how, you know, how, what's your marketing plan? And what about this? And what about that? And they were like, can you just sign this piece of paper for me? <laughs> Why are you asking me all these questions, lady? So I realized that there was such a need right in that moment of, um, 
there's these couple of touch points where packaged food entrepreneurs, right? Like um, they're making something delicious in their home kitchen and everybody tells them that they should start a business and it's going to be amazing. And so they, they start some research and they Google, right? Like start a, start a food business and that gets them a million hits. And then they start narrowing it down. But a lot of times they do start with a, a commissary kitchen depending on their food and, and their, their goals. But, you know, the, the small business development center was another place I, I met people, but those, those commissary kitchens is a touch point for people. And I realized that there was a big gap in knowledge and setting people up for success in, in their journey. Um, so that's where <laughs> my business was born and my passion for helping entrepreneurs create, I like to say, create profitable food businesses, not expensive hobbies. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Did So did you start classes and education kind of within the commissary kitchen? We, we have a few commissary kitchen and incubator kitchens. We know that actually do that? You know, I, I didn't at that time. I love the incubator model. Um, the kitchen didn't last very long. <laughs> so, um, she, she moved on to other things, but I, I, it actually is a, a dream of mine to eventually have my own kitchen and run an incubator style program out of that. But yeah, that's kind of, I think I'm getting too old to start, <laughs> but that was, that was always a goal because it's yeah. such a need hope and Maine. Um, you know, yes. the folks, yeah, Sila and, and the folks up in San Francisco, whose name is escaping me right this second. Um, there's just some beautiful incubator programs. And Say Kitchen, who's been mm-hmm. a, a local sponsor of ours way back in the day when we did the Vendor 101 program in person, uh, they do a lot of in-house classes for entrepreneurs, and it's really smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's so helpful. It is kind of the Wild West out there when it comes to just commissaries. And, and like you said, um, especially getting to the farmer's market, if you're um, a, a package good company, you kind of just need that commissary person to sign that piece of paper so you can, <laughs> you can get into the market. And unfortunately there are some commissary operators that recognize that they kind of just are this gatekeeper. And so they'll just kind of sign papers for people without really kind of checking out what those producers are doing. So it's nice to have more commissary operators or commercial kitchen operators that really want to help people out and make sure that uh, you know, they're above board practices and even more than that, you know, they're, they're building a, their business on a strong foundation, making sure that they're, yeah. they're starting out um, with profit in mind yeah. from the very beginning. Absolutely. Exactly. And, and I actually have a number of partnerships now with commissary kitchens because a lot of owners are like, I don't have the bandwidth for an incubator. But when people apply, they just, they have like a template email and I just sent, you know, we send them all my resources. And so it becomes almost like a partnership, like a ad hoc incubator. That's <laughs> so. great. And you, you operate a market now, right? Sarah? Yes. I, I'm an unusual combination of, uh, I, I work with packaged food businesses. That's my main, my main, um, business, but then I have a side hustle, I guess, <laughs> of, uh, of I own a farmer's market uh, in Colorado. It's called Fort Collins Winter Farmer's Market. Um, obviously, it's very cold right now in Colorado. I'm super jealous of your weather in San Diego <laughs> That's right nice now. Blue uh, skies. <laughs> it was negative six the other morning when I woke Ooh, up. But, uh, yikes. <laughs> oh, we get so excited and nervous when it's 60. Yes. <laughs> you know, so. like drag out the big coats. Put my it's, ski it's jacket 59. on. Yeah. <laughs> We're scared. <laughs> we don't often have people describe themselves as a market owner. Um, it's usually operator or manager. So yeah. what's the structure in Colorado for operating a farmer's market? What's what's required in order to, to do that? Each yeah. state is so different. Uh-huh. Right. Well, so the market has been around, this is its 14th year. So it's it's a long-term market. It was created by a nonprofit to create that winter outlet as we were extending the growing season. Obviously, packaged food producers are still, you know, making like, because it's Colorado. So the outdoor markets would shut down in October and then there was nothing for six months. And so, you know, how can we create those outlets and the sales channels for everybody from crafts to um, ranchers. And, and even uh, we do have growers, you know, we, we have lettuce year round and (laughs) um, lots of root vegetables and things. So uh, that 
that nonprofit kind of um, disintegrated about nine years in, and then another nonprofit took it over, and I was involved with that nonprofit. So that's when I really came in as like market manager or co-manager and got involved. And then that nonprofit imploded and it was really ugly. And I just had such a heart for that farmer's market. But ultimately, I I just had to walk away and say, okay, um, you know, this is out of my hands. And then um, that next season, uh, the, the vendors came and said, we need you to, Zeri, you're the only one who knows this market inside and out. You have the experience. Like, we need you to to take this on. And obviously I'm not a nonprofit. So, um, I was kind of awarded (laughs) given, I don't know, like given the market, like here's the keys and, um, do with it what you will. And so I picked that up. So yeah, I'm not a nonprofit. So So the state of Colorado doesn't require a nonprofit or a, so in California, Mm -hmm. um, you've got to be a nonprofit or a, governmental agency, like a right. city, or in our case, we work with a lot of business improvement districts, or a farmer. You have to be a farm co-op of some kind in order to own the permit to operate yeah. a market. So Colorado doesn't have that kind of restriction. They don't. And I actually do have a new nonprofit partner, which is great because they help with sponsorships and some of the EBT things, the SNAP. And so it's been a nice partnership. And then I hire a market manager. So I guess that's why I kind of step back a little. Like, I guess I am a manager, but I also do have like an official. Oh, gotcha. Cool. <laughs> market manager who, who's, I have an amazing, amazing staff. Oh, good. I couldn't do without him. <laughs> cool. So you're more the director and then somebody else is yeah, doing that 5.30 a.m. shift. We know how that goes. <laughs> On site. <laughs> with the measuring wheel guy. <laughs> that's right. With the measuring wheel. That's me. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We, so we bought one of those this year for COVID. <laughs> They're the best. So what? So that leads us to our next question. What kind of changes did you have to make for COVID? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. So <laughs> everything. <laughs> I know. So last year, you know, was the first year. It was really like my direction. And, um, you know, we have 12 markets a year. So we go kind of every other weekend, basically. And, um, The we were uh, going to have a market like two weeks out and everything started happening. And I was on the phone with the health department and they kept saying, no, no, it's fine. You're fine. And then, uh, you know, I'm communicating to vendors and saying, no, no, we're still having it. And then it was like the Friday before then I got the call that said, nope, everything, you know, locked down. So that was really tough. I mean, you're trying to make the best decisions you can in the moment with the information you have. And, you know, I know people were very upset um, with that last minute closure, but it was out of my hands. Um, And then, of course, it was like, oh, well, maybe in two weeks we can, (laughs) you know, like looking back now, it's like, oh, there was no way. But (laughs) we were we had hope, you know. Um, but then we ended up going ahead and just canceling the rest of the season, oh. um, kind uh-huh. of working through some refunds and because we were inside and it was before things were like, no, you're an essential business. And some of those guidelines were, had come out. So, you know, that was right in March. So we missed, I guess, three, three markets. Oh, cause um, you were almost done anyway. Your season yeah. was almost finished. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So And then it was like, oh gosh, you know, what is going to happen? Well, we were in a a space um, that there was just no way I could accommodate the six foot. So in that space, we could squeeze in like 55 vendors and it was tight, like aisles. We always got complaints about the aisles and (laughs) all of that. So uh, it was like, I looked at the numbers and I said, there's, there's just no way that this will pencil out. And um so I started looking for a new vendor, new new venues, and uh, I had always had in the back of my mind we have a the Foothills Mall, which was like the mall in the '80s that I you know grew up frequenting the, the food court <laughs> and <laughs> Orange Julius, <laughs> all the things. And um, so it's big, and they had done a renovation, uh, it has big open hallways and empty storefronts. And so I'd always thought, you know, when we're ready to move, I want to talk to them all. And 
So, uh, I approached them and, uh, it just was great timing. And she was like, yeah, I mean, obviously we're looking for ways to get more people to us and come to the mall. Uh, so it just became a really great win-win partnership. So we've had a lot of, I mean, lots of challenges and figuring things out, but, uh, it's given us the space and actually now we're at 72 vendors. So oh, we actually, oh, that's, wow. in- so that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but that's good. Do that they give you the space, space because they want to bring more traffic to the mall or do you pay rent there? I do pay rent, but it's very low. They kind oh. of consider it a marketing. <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We and- talked to a market manager in Salt Lake city who had a similar thing with their winter market. They were able to take over a mall and it sounds like a, a win-win if there ever was one. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, cause it was, we started in November and the, the mall folks, the security guards were like, we haven't seen this many people. In, <laughs> in months, yeah. It was like human you know? contact. <laughs> right? yeah. Faces or at yeah. least above the nose. Yes. Heads. Eyes. <laughs> Heads. Eyes. That's yeah. Great. But then we had the challenge of how do we communicate to the public that this is an essential service? This is like going to the grocery store and you're supporting local, right? So it's that that triple win of like supporting local business and getting your groceries and having transparency and, and just supporting the overall community. Um, but we were getting lots of complaints about I mean, obviously we draw crowds and it was before the holidays and we're a little bit, you know, it's Colorado, it's a little bit mixed, but it was a little bit of like, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask and <laughs> a little wild, wild west. And then we were getting complaints. And so we ended up like doing six feet apart and then eight feet apart and then 10 feet apart. And now we've come back. Um, and I, I feel like we're in a good groove now where most people are complying and but yeah it, it's been a a big learning curve and lots of lots of shifts I feel like I've been the Tetris market manager like the map <laughs> you know of like the map is constantly changing and reshifting and shuffling people around and yeah and yeah. how do vendors react to that because oh. in our experience <laughs> if you move a vendor 10 feet they're sure that none of their customers will ever find them yes. <laughs> and they're they do not like to move they're they're kind of set in their ways <laughs> they are it's been challenging I mean we've tried to be really upfront with people like this is a new location there's going to be a lot of growing pains it's covid like these are things <laughs> you know even just moving to a new location without COVID would be growing pains and learnings, but then you throw in that. And some vendors have been amazing. I would say like 80% have been amazing. And then there's the, you know, 10, 20% that love to tell you um, how they don't love their spot or how could I move them? And, and, you know, we did bring it, we did allow craft vendors to come in, but we have always said that, you know, you are not the first priority. We are a food market and we are an essential business because we are food. And so we would love for you to be here, but you're not always going to get the most prime spots. Yeah. You know, I think that's a line that a lot of market managers are towing now because even if you were mostly food and farm before, but had a good craft section, it's like now we're really, we need to be sure that we're staying consistent that we're an essential business and that means food. And so we, you know, want to invite those craft vendors back, but it's like, look, we can't put you front and center. We can't like highlight you because we are a grocery store basically. So we need to stay aligned with that kind of thing. And so I know some of our craft vendors are also like feeling a little frustrated with that, but it's just how the markets are right now. So it's just, if they want it to be open at all and have a place to come at all, it's just how we have to operate right now. So yeah, it's been tough. It is. And I find, I'm sure you guys see this at your markets and every market manager can probably relate to this, that there are just certain people that you could move anywhere. You could give them the least desirable spot and they will still have amazing sales. And I think so much of that is attitude and just people's ability to kind of be flexible and roll with it. And then, you know, you could move a vendor to another great spot, but now they're mad that they moved and then they have a terrible day in sales. And it's like, I get it. You're frustrated, but it is up to the vendor to create that positive energy and show up and look I mean, engaging. That's the, and, 
Yeah. Yeah, it's the trick to farmers market businesses mm-hmm. versus other businesses. You're not just putting it in a box and delivering mm-hmm. it for somebody else to put on the shelf. That yeah. your personality and your positive outlook and being upbeat is so much a part of your sales. Yeah, yeah. just develop that, like develop, make that space great. You know, yeah. like no matter what spot you're in. So yeah, we have those conversations a lot with our vendors. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, mostly you can kind of convince them to, you know, what the pros are of the space that they're in. But yeah, it's been tough, especially with COVID, having to move people around based on a whole bunch of things that not a lot of people understand. Like shoppers don't understand, vendors don't understand that we have to move people depending on like fencing and what category you're in and what space you're in and what the foot traffic is there. And, you know, if you have a line at your booth, you can't be right near an entrance or right near an exit because you're going to block the way. So it's just those kind of million different moving parts that Mm -hmm. not everyone sees. That's right. (laughs) Um, so then, um, when you're not doing the farmer's market stuff, you provide education consulting to packaged food businesses, both for retail distribution and at farmer's market. So what is like one of the hottest or new products you've seen recently, or how do you do that um, in conjunction with your job managing the market? Yeah, I think that they dovetail really nicely uh, in that, you know, as a market manager, it's like, how can I help? producers be more successful, both at, both at the market, but then just in their business, whether they're doing, maybe the market is one of their outlets, but they want to do e-commerce or um, wholesale or, or all of the different options out there. And, uh, you know, I would say our market has a turnover of like, we definitely have our staple, obviously farmers and ranchers and craft folks. And then it seems like Packaged food, about half of them kind of stay on long term and we see them year after year. And then there's kind of always this new crop of folks who have gotten inspired and, you know, ready to launch their business and and come to the farmer's market. And so those are the people I love to connect with and say, you know, here's this, um, I do have a farmer's market jumpstart course, kind of similar to your education course that just like, here's what to expect when you're starting. And um I have like a, my favorite thing, my favorite thing, um, like all the the tools that I would buy if I was starting at a farmer's market, like, like the Oprah list, but mm-hmm. <laughs> for farmer's markets. Um, so that's a great place for people to start if they're just thinking farmer's markets. I think it's such a great place for people to launch and to start experimenting. And I mean, I want them to show up professional and look good, but I do think that there is lower barrier to entry at farmers markets than going in directly into, you know, large scale wholesale or Amazon or something. And um, it's a great place to get market feedback, like actual feedback from real customers, right? Even if they don't buy, you can tell a lot by (laughs) their reaction when you walk away, right? Yeah, it's that whole focus group piece that's nice. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. Yeah, and even with just applying to the farmer's markets, at least with our markets, we always require samples before, you know, we Mm -hmm. let you start your first day or accept you as a vendor. And so just, you know, even getting feedback from a market manager before you get into the farmer's Mm -hmm. market is great focus group because oftentimes we know market managers, we're honest, we'll tell you (laughs) if we don't think it's ready for public consumption. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Even so before your vendor, feedback. it's helpful. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah. we're not going to put people in the market that aren't going to succeed. That's not really, it's not like a, you're not setting up in front of your house and you can just go in and fold up the table if it's not working. Like if you're going to be a part of a farmer's market, you're going to be part of a business. So you need to come in with that kind of expectation and that professionalism. So it's a nice place to start and get that really direct, specific feedback about yeah. your product yeah. for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, especially before you start to buy really expensive uh, you know, equipment or before you invest your life savings in expensive labels or (laughs) a huge team, or you build out your own kitchen. There is, I I totally agree with somebody that started my business at farmer's markets there, you know, it is obviously a lot of work and there's a lot that goes into it, but it is a lower barrier to entry than, you know, getting a demo team and like visiting, the five whole foods in your region, you know, yeah. you and can having start to produce smaller. that kind of quantity. So you yeah. can start with smaller quantities. So then you, if something, if feedback comes back that you need to change something, you can make that change without completely wasting, you know, thousands exactly. of dollars in inventory. So yeah, yeah there's such a great, 
you know, there's so many ways to make it work at the market. Yeah, when you're you first don't starting necessarily out. need like a sprinter van. Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, you can put it in a VW bug. That's <laughs> right. We love to talk about our vendor with the VW bug that yeah. comes in looking like the Beverly Hillbilly so, <laughs> stuff piled high. <laughs> You know, I always talk about it uh, with my clients and students like a stair step. So um, for a lot of startup businesses in the world, there's kind of this J curve of like, they call it the valley of death where you go into debt first, right? And you're putting in all the money and nothing's happening. And then you start making sales and you come out of it. But with food, like let's say, I mean, cottage food is awesome for people who fall under the, you know, their food falls into that category. Like, you can start with very little capital investment and then um, launch. And then, so you go up the stair step and then you're like, Oh wait, now I want to go into another sales category or um, do some other things with it. Or, you know, I'm going to go into four farmers markets or whatever it is. And so then, then you go into like another mini little Valley of death. Right? <laughs> you got to fundraise. Now you need to go into a kitchen. Now you need to, you should be investing in higher quality packaging or those nicer labels, maybe get a design reboot or something like that. So every time you go up, scale up, it's going to require that new investment and that new (laughs) uncomfortable growth period for sure. Yeah. But it is also really true. Like if you're just doing wholesale for example, like most, you know, most people that you're selling to, they're going to want to put you on like net 30 and, you know, you have to wait for that yep. income to come back to do more. But if you're, you know, if you start at the farmer's markets, like I remember our first day, we, we made close to a thousand dollars on our first day yeah. and we were like freaking out. Cause you know, we only put like four grand into it to get to the farmer's market. And we're like, Holy crap. We almost like made back, we made back like almost a quarter of our investment. And so it was just kind of that stepping stone where had we started out selling a thousand dollars worth of merchandise to wholesalers, it would take us probably more than a month to get that back. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It is and, it is a great way to start for for CPG businesses. And your investment would have been way more than four grand totally. too to, yeah. to get that inventory. So yeah, anytime we're dealing with packaged food, you're building up inventory for most, you know, unless it's like fresh baked bread or something like that. But you're building up inventory and all of that costs you money until you sell it, sell it. So I love people doing a combination of farmers markets. I have a hot sauce client who has like eight farmers markets to help with that cash flow, And then they also do the wholesale and the Amazon. And so they've layered those things in over time, but started at the farmer's market. So I don't think that you necessarily like, it's not that you have to stop being at farmer's markets when you go into those other places, they can actually be a really nice compliment yeah. for cash flow and brand awareness. And, and I think it gives you the sense of street cred too. When people <laughs> yeah. feel like they can buy your product at Whole Foods or Amazon for some like local foodie diehard sometimes like, oh, that person's a sellout. But if you continue <laughs> to like have your booth at the farmer's market, it mm-hmm. kind of anchors you. Like we have a couple here in San Diego, like Prager Brothers that are mm-hmm. really big or, you know, Maya's yeah. Cookies that are really growing fast. But because they continue to have their their spot at the farmer's market, it kind of continues to remind people like, even if we get really big, we are a local company. We are invested in yep. like putting our money back into this local economy. Yeah, for sure. Sarah, what's, what's your kind of main expertise? Do you, are you a costing superstar? Are you, (laughs) is branding your, your superpower? What would you say? There's so many millions of things you have to know to start a food business, but do you have a particular one that's sort of your specialty that you do better than anybody else? Yeah. Great question. So the way I describe what I do is that I help Package food entrepreneurs start or grow their their business, their brand. And I just say, you know, whatever your sales goal is, if you want to be in Whole Foods, if you want to be in a farmer's market, anywhere in between, all of them, we can do it. And I like to think of myself as a very holistic one-stop shop. So I either do one-on-one consulting where I guide the whole process or food business success is DIY with me there as a, um, we have private one-on-one calls to help people kind of get their questions answered, keep them moving along, have accountability and support. So I like to say that I am pretty holistic and that you can come to me and 
from everything from profitability to branding to go to market strategies. I have a lot of um, people I work with, though. I have amazing graphic designers. I have food scientists. So I, I definitely have a team of um, subcontractors and people I rely on. Um, I would say my particular forte is definitely around uh, profitability and cost of goods sold and forecasting um, and just running it like a business, right? Like you got to wear both hats. You need the passion, the brand, the, you know, the, all the reasons why people typically get into a food business is because they are so passionate about it and it's so fun to share your food. But then usually I find those people also have a really hard time putting on the business hat <laughs> and <laughs> be the CEO, right, of their, of their brand and making those hard decisions, um, they come in with a lot of ideals. I want to be compostable and organic and <laughs> all the things and um, have this amazing branding. And, and uh, you know, sometimes those things don't pencil out on uh, very well, unless you have very deep pockets. Uh, and you want to invest a lot of money, which most of my people don't. So, um, so yeah, we, I get into the, really that costing profitability because you have to say, when you're starting a farmer's market, you need to be setting yourself up for your your immediate goals of success at a market. But then if you do want to be in wholesale or you do want to go on Amazon or other online marketplaces or your own website, there's something called price parity where you don't want a grocery store, like a grocery store can't charge double what you're charging at a farmer's market. And I think Sometimes people don't understand that and they don't figure out their cost of goods sold correctly. And so when they want to go to the next level, that's a big wake up call. That's very painful when they have to raise prices on their farmer's market customers or um, have to cut some of the things that are really important to them. We call it value engineering. <laughs> Sounds better. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Justine, did you find that when you went from farmer's markets to wholesaling? Did you... Or did you plan ahead pretty well for that? Or was that sort of a shock? Because I know that a lot of our folks, we're constantly telling them, they'll say, oh, the forager came by from Whole Foods or some grocery store and they want to mm-hmm. take me. And we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa let me see your numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know? yeah. You, you know you can't sell to them for the same price you're selling at the market, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we when we started at Farmer's Markets, we kind of thought that it was going to be a temporary thing because we really saw ourselves doing more wholesale and just mostly doing online sales. But we quickly figured out that we loved farmers markets and my husband is kind of just like, I don't know, he's just like a very like grandstanding, like likes to talk to people. And um, so he loved the constant like social interaction and he loved farmers markets. Um, So luckily we had kind of clear numbers for wholesale and um, our problem was though, and you might experience this with your clients, is that we initially were doing everything ourselves, like 100% everything ourselves so we didn't include labor costs in Uh. our um, in our initial (laughs) like numbers um luckily we had enough of a we had actually like really good profit margins um even when we started to include our labor um and so that luckily we were okay when we transitioned to a co-packer um but had we not found the right co-packer or you know had we not had a good enough cushion in that Mm -hmm. um profit margin we would have had a really, really hard time. Wait, you went to Vendor 101, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. So you had a clue. Yeah. Of course. All right. Had a I clue. forgot about that. Had a little clue about it. <laughs> yeah. That's the biggest thing I see is that cost of goods sold and the labor part because it's like, yeah. I mean, I know you're not writing yourself a check, right? Like, you're not like, well, I was here in the kitchen for four hours. Let me write myself a check. <laughs> But you have to factor it in ahead of time because then it can really bite you when you do want to grow. And then they're like, well, I have 45% margins. I'm doing pretty good. And I'm like, yeah, but if you don't have labor in there, you don't have 45%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's the main thing everybody always either forgets or (laughs) kind of wants to fight with you about it. Well, I'm investing in my business. Well, okay. (laughs) That's good. But you still need to take that into account in order to come up with a real cost of goods. And I think that goes back to what you said about um, people that are starting their own companies. There is something especially like emotional about food. And so I think Mm -hmm. that you see um, when people start CPG companies or food companies in general, there is this like intense passion where it's like kind of like their life's mission of like, I'm going to change the world through this thing. 
Um, but that's when you have to really have to pair it with that business side of things because mm -hmm. when you're so passionate and excited about something, it's impossible for you to ever think that you're not going to want to be the person in the kitchen forever. Like when David and I first started, we're like, we're going to make hot sauce forever. We want to always do it. Just us two. And we never want to hire help. And we're like, this is our, you know, mission in life. And then two years in, we're like, wow, I would pay someone a million dollars to go make hot sauce for me right now. Like, this is not what I want to do. And so I think it's so important to like, think of those things and make those decisions ahead of time because your future self will think you would just be like, I'm so glad I factored in the <laughs> idea of someone doing this for me one day. Yeah. Oh, oh, and your time is still worth something. I mean, yeah. there's an opportunity cost. If you're always giving your time away for free to your own business, then what are you missing out on that you could be doing? Totally. Right? That's right. Yeah. And it's fine to cost. do it for a while, but have a plan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so what are, in your experience, what do you think are like the two or three main differences in starting a packaged food business at a farmer's market versus, um, if you're going straight to wholesale distribution? Cause there are big differences. And I know we have this conversation like with our vendor one-on-one -on -one students a lot. Um, but what do you see as someone who's really, um, knows a lot about the wholesale side of it? What do you see that are the big differences there? I mean, a lot of it comes down to what we were just talking about, the pricing piece. And, and so your quantities in order to get the margins that you need when you go into distribution, I mean, wholesale, they're going to take 20, you know, 30% of your margin. And then you add a distributor, that's another 20, 30%. And then you're just left with pennies. <laughs> like, they call this the, you know, the business of a thousand cuts for a reason. Everybody takes their cut and then you're left with the little scraps left over. So um, in order to actually make money, it's all about quantity. And so the investment is much larger when you start going into wholesale. So that's a big piece of it. Um, but then also things like shelf stability and, and maybe some more food science pieces might need to be brought in depending on the product, of course. But a grocery store is going to have much higher expectations of, you know, shelf quality and shelf life. Um, and certainly even packaging. I think, again, I, I mean, I want you to show up and look great, but there are definitely less expensive kinds of packaging that you can start out with, with stickers and, and bags or, you know, doing your own thing versus like a pre-printed, <laughs> you know, stand up pouch that you have to buy a minimum of 3,500 versus buying you know, 200 of something or 500. So I think that's one of the biggest things. I mean, certainly, I mean, the whole world of, of wholesale is kind of its own vocabulary and its own universe. I mean, from promotions to free fills and demos and all of the things that you're required to do, credits and scan backs and coupons. And so it's, it's a whole other, whole other ball game that, definitely recommend if people are not in the food industry that they get some help. Yeah, highly recommend. I mean, we're, we obviously promote education at all mm -hmm. levels, but yeah. I think that's an important part. You may think that you know the food industry because you've been at markets for a while, but mm -hmm. making that leap into wholesale, we really recommend that yeah. you, you go back to that education stage and realize that there's more to learn. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel think, like it's the same as someone going from the farmer's market to like a brick and mortar. Like if you're yeah, going to open a coffee shop, right. you're not going to use the knowledge that you have running your booth at the farmer's market to open a shop. Yeah. I mean, know, there's some things that'll translate yeah, customer service and things, but yeah. there's, but pricing and mm -hmm. um, staff allocation and yeah. stuff is just a whole new ball game when you get into brick and mortar. Yeah. I think the smartest thing you can do as an entrepreneur is go find somebody else who's done it, understands it so that you don't have to become an expert at learning how to do it. You can just do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll oh, be an expensive uh, trial and error for you. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper to just invest yeah. in an expert. I mean, and that will happen. Like, yeah. so, <laughs> that too. You'll make It'll your own mistakes. Still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can make it on a smaller scale, though. Yeah. Maybe those mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, um, I at Whole Foods, one of my jobs for a little while at the regional office was onboarding local producers. And so I saw that a lot where we would go into a new market. We opened in Boise and we bring in all of these, you know, farmer's market vendors like, yay, you're going to be on the shelves of Whole Foods. And then they didn't anticipate the, the cash flow cycle, um, the quality standards, the consistency. And I mean, some, we actually like 
unfortunately put some people out of business because they didn't, they were just so blindsided and they were so excited and like starry eyed about getting into whole foods, but they didn't understand what would really go into it. And I hate that. that that's... Yeah, it's sad. We've seen that a number of times. Yeah, but it's yeah. just that jump that happens. I think it's the same kind of jump that happens from someone starting out making food, you know, at, for their bake sale. And someone says, hey, you should start, you know, yeah. a farmer's market booth. And so they make that leap. And and some of those businesses haven't made it because they haven't anticipated just the next step, step up. So it's just like every time your business takes a step up, you yeah. know, go, you should go into it as prepared as possible because it's such big leaps and you can really just drive yourself out of business if you don't do it the right way, for sure. Just, just like any business. We call it succeeding yourself right out of business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And we hate to see it. So we just, you know, always, that's why we really like encourage all these programs that are out there. Um, like our own education course, yours, Allie's, like everything that's out there, that is, those are there and those are doing well for a reason. It's because they're really helpful for people that are trying to, you know, make their business a success and whether or not they're scaling up, just doing it right from the start as yeah. much as they can. <laughs> and like what we always tell people at the beginning of Vendor 101, mm-hmm. if at the end of this course you decide that you don't want to do this, yeah. that is the best use of money possible. You spent $200 <laughs> yes. finding out that you don't want to spend $10,000. Yeah. And that's a really great investment too. Yeah, exactly. and I'm sure your master classes and things are the same way, mm-hmm. um, yes. Sari. It's just, a, it's like, a good investment even. We always say it's a good outcome if you learn what you need to know to go forward. And it's a good outcome too if you learn that this really isn't for you yeah. And, yeah. and get out of it you know with a minimum investment in education versus <laughs> investing your life savings so. yeah right yeah uh- hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. I listen to NPR's How I Built This podcast all uh-huh. the time. And there's a lot of um, people on there that have scaled like way, way up. And so they make the jump to wholesale and they have the most nightmare stories. Like yes. they end up succeeding. And so it's a good place to listen and learn to people, you know, to learn from their mistakes. But it's just like so many things can just drive you out of business or into serious debt if you're not going about it the right way if you just kind of get picked up by a forger and try to make that leap without knowing what to do and having that so it's well a lot of time they end up giving up a lot of equity in their business because they get to that point where they're stuck Mm -hmm, and the only way to go forward is to borrow and whoever wants to give you that much money is going to take a big chunk of your business so this thing that you built and that you have that passion for Mm -hmm. gets sacrificed to that which yeah um, yeah, planning ahead can kind of save some of those sad stories (laughs) well on a positive note. Yeah. Yeah. It's not all doing positive side to wrap up here. We'll help you. We'll help you. And (laughs) yes. Um, So sorry. Yeah. We are going to wrap up here just because. Yes. The timing. But if you can just tell us, is there some kind of um, like new cool packaged food item that you've seen either with your um, classes that you've been doing or at your farmer's market? Um, I've seen a lot of stuff around immunity. Uh, we had a kelp or like a seaweed gel that was really interesting. Now the, the downside is when you have a really kind of out there product, you need a lot of education. And when you can't sample, it's can be more challenging, but I love that people are coming up with lots of, you know, how to nurture your immune system with COVID and everything. So lots of cool stuff around fermenting and yeah. That is kind of a lot of new fermented stuff. Yeah, um, and you know what I saw yesterday uh, was caviar made out of seaweed. Oh, I know she fish in the market. Did she? Yeah, it doesn't have quite the pop Uh in your mouth, but it looks exactly like caviar. It tastes similar. Thank you. Yeah. I don't like pop. pop. <laughs> Justine doesn't pop. want to even like the original. So. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I, thought, for cats I thought it was a really it. well done takeoff of yeah. caviar. Actually, it was amazing. But I'm obvi- and, but again, sort of a niche product, like yeah. because obviously there's a lot of people in the world like that. Justine that don't even I want, want real caviar. <laughs> Unless it's like pop rocks or something. <laughs> kind of, but fishy. Is not that, is that seaweed, sounding more appealing? Seaweed pop rocks. Yeah. Seaweed pop rocks. That would be oh, Okay. Actually. Um. Oh, man. Yeah, there's lots of cool stuff coming out. I do feel like COVID, the whole COVID thing, everyone's being like even more aware and hyper aware about like their body's health and nutrition and stuff. And so that has really been great at the farmer's market. People are taking even more of an interest in that. And so it's a good opportunity for food makers to... And their local food system. Yeah, Because, you know, having been frightened in the spring (laughs) by empty shelves at the grocery store, I think people are definitely Mm -hmm. taking it more seriously that we need to preserve our local system. Yeah, for sure. Yes. 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 I'm seeing that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it was really great to speak with you. Finally. Nice to meet you and speak with you and 
I mean, I really think our listeners will get a lot out of this and to check out everything that you're doing um, will be so helpful too. Yeah, we'll have uh, Food Business Success information in the show notes so that you can find them when you listen to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Yeah. And thanks for being with us. Yeah, yes. oh, My pleasure. So fun. Thank thanks, you for having Harry. me. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Farmers markets are all about community, and all of us, operators, farmers, and vendors, keep learning. To learn what's happening from people just like you in various parts of the country, or share what's happening in your area, we have terrific conversations and people sharing resources over in our private Facebook group, the Farmers Market Pros Community. Please find us there, answer the three qualifying questions, and join the group. You can also message us on Instagram at Farmers Market Pros or send us an email at connect at farmersmarketpros.com. Thanks so much for listening to Tent Talk. Please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you access your podcasts and tell us and others how you're enjoying Tent Talk. If you're listening on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss our next episode. Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market podcast, is proudly produced by Farmer's Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine Marzoni-Mead. Original music by David Mead. Thank you so much for listening today, and we'll have another great episode next week. Tune in.